Hello, welcome to Sigma Tech Learning Hall. I'll be your instructor for biology. For this class, we are going to be taking our exercises from the exam guide app. Now, if you don't already have this installed in your device, I would like you to download the app in order to follow along in this class. Now, exam guide is a leading educational app that helps students prepare adequately for various exams. Exams such as the UTME, the post-UTME, WIAC, GCE, IGMB, KCPE, JUPEB, Calbepedia. In the junior sections, we also have the BECE, we have the JSCE, and so much more. Now, you can download the app from www.examguide.com or you visit the Google Play Store to download. Now, please subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to update yourselves on new videos that will be coming up. Now, if you're ready for this class, let's get started. Today, we're going to be looking at microorganisms around us. Microorganisms around us. Now, in this particular topic, we're going to be discussing the definition of microorganisms. We are also going to be looking at um, types of microorganisms and discuss a little on those, li on those types of microorganisms. We're also going to be discussing what we call culturing technique or culturing of microorganisms. And then also we're going to be looking at ways microorganisms gain entrance or enter the body. And then we're going to be talking about carriers of microorganisms. Now, at the end of this particular class, you are expected to note some things and um, one of them is that you should be able to define microorganisms and mention the types of microorganisms we have. Number two, you should be able to explain the concept of culturing microorganisms. Explain the concept of culturing microorganisms. Number three, you should be able to outline ways microorganisms enter into the body. And finally, number four, you should be able to mention the carriers of microorganisms. So if you're set, let's begin with microorganisms around us. Now, by definition, microorganisms are tiny organisms which cannot be seen with the naked eyes except with the aid of what we call a microscope. A microscope is actually a device that helps us view um, tiny organisms, tiny organisms that are not visible to the naked eyes. If you check our videos on cells, we talked more on microscopes. We looked at microscopes and the different types of microscopes. And the branch of biology that actually deals with the study of microorganisms is what we call microbiology. It's a branch of biology that deals with the study of microorganisms. Now, there are several basic facts I would like you to understand about microorganisms. Several basic things you should remember about microorganisms. Number one, microorganisms can be found everywhere. They can be found everywhere. They can be found in the air. They can be found in water. They can be found on soil and in the soil. They can even be found on your clothes. They can even be found on or in your body. They can be found on your body, and they can be found in your body. They are everywhere. Microorganisms are everywhere. Number two important fact to take note of about microorganisms is that some microorganisms are harmful, <clears throat> and while some are beneficial, there are harmful microorganisms, there are also harmless microorganisms, and there are harmful, or oh, sorry, beneficial microorganisms. So, but let's put it in these two categories. We have harmful microorganisms, and then we have beneficial microorganisms. Number three important fact to take note of is that microorganisms can be controlled. They can be controlled. Microorganisms can be controlled. Mostly the harmful ones can be controlled. And number four is that microorganisms can be grown in the laboratory artificially. You can grow microorganisms in the laboratory for studies and research purposes. Microorganisms are grown in the laboratory for research purposes and for study, all right? Now, 
let's take a look at types of microorganisms. We have basically um, five types of microorganisms. Let's look at just these five types of microorganisms. We have what we call virus. It is a microorganism. We have bacteria. We have fungi. We have protozoa. And we have algae. Virus, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, algae. These are types of microorganisms. Now let's begin with the first one which is called a virus. A virus. I believe that word is not new to us here. A virus. When we were discussing um, classifications of living things, we made mention of virus. And I told you that virus, they are so, they are microorganisms that are very too tiny, too small to be seen even with a light microscope. Using a hand lens, you can't view a virus. Using a light microscope, you can't view virus. Using a compound microscope, you can't also view virus. Virus can be seen using an electron microscope. Not only that, we have different types of viruses. We said that we have what we call the adenovirus, we have the toga virus, we have the coronavirus, we have the picanovirus, we have the human immunovirus, and so many types of viruses we have. We also have bacteriophage. Bacteriophage is actually a virus that digests or, or feeds on bacteria. So you see that virus have um, a, a relationship with other microorganisms, example, bacteria. Now, virus, remember we said some things about virus. So let's look at some basic facts about virus. Now, one of the things you should understand that virus is neither a living organism nor a non-living organism. You can't classify virus as a living organism or as a non-living organism. In other words, virus stands at the borderline between living and non-living. Now, when do we say a virus is a living organism? It is when it is inside a host. When it is inside a host. That is when we say a virus is actually a living organism. But when it is outside a host, a virus plays the role of a non-living organism. Now, what are some of the activities that tells us that the virus is a living organism when inside a host? An example is that virus is able to replicate, or it simply means it is able to transmit its genetic material from one generation to another. That is a type of reproduction. And of course, you know that one of the characteristics of living things is that they are able to reproduce. They are able to carry out or transport or transmit their genetic materials from one generation to another. Virus has that same ability, but only when it is inside a living host. Now, what are some of the characteristics of virus that tells us that it is a non-living thing when outside a living host? Now, when outside a living host, virus does not, re um, does not excrete, it does not respire, it does not also respond to stimulus. It just assumes a state of a crystalline form and it remains a non-entity, okay? So that is virus for you. Another important fact of virus is that it is the simplest and it is the smallest uh, microorganisms that do not have cell structure. A virus is the smallest, simplest microorganism that do not have a cell structure. Now, some virus, they are rod-like, while some are spherical. They have different shapes of virus. Now, each virus cell consists of a strand of nuclear materials. So you can't say that a virus has a definite structure. It doesn't have a nucleus. It doesn't have any other organelles in the cytoplasm. In, in its own cytoplasm, if it has, then, but it, you, all you just see in a virus is a strand of nuclear protein. And this strand of nuclear protein sometimes can be RNA or it can be DNA. And that's why, why we can group viruses as either RNA virus or we can call it a DNA virus. Another important fact I want you to understand about a virus is that some viruses are enveloped or some are not enveloped. That means they are naked. They are not encapsulated. Most of the virus you see that are enveloped, they are enveloped when they are outside a living cell.
or a host cell. Now, next, um, next microorganisms we're going to be looking at is bacteria. 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 Now, we have different types of um, bacteria. But before we go into different types of bacteria, I want you to understand that a bacteria is also a tiny microorganism, but it can be seen with the aid of a light microscope. That is one major difference between a bacteria and a virus. We said virus cannot be seen with a light microscope. It can only be seen with an electron microscope, which has a higher magnification power. But in terms of virus, sorry, bacteria rather, we can view bacteria using a light microscope. Now, bacteria, some of them occur in clusters, while some of them occur in colonies. You see some of them in straight chains and all that. You see some of them compacted together in clusters and so on. But one thing you should understand that a virus, sorry, a bacteria is prokaryotic. It is prokaryotic in the sense that it does not have a definite nucleus. It doesn't have a definite nucleus. Now, let's look at some other important things we should talk about a virus. Like I said, it does not have a definite nucleus, though it has a cell, well, cell wall and cell membrane. And another thing again to understand that is that most virus, sorry, most bacteria have flagella. And one of the major functions of a flagella or flagellum is for locomotion. So it means that a bacteria can locomote. Now, take note, bacteria can be, for now, can be divided into two main groups or types. Now, it is simply based on their use of oxygen. That's number one. Number two is based on their shape. So we can classify bacteria into two based on their use of oxygen and based on their shape. Now, based on their use of oxygen, we have three types of bacteria. We have what we call the aerobic bacteria, which simply means that these bacteria require oxygen for respiration and survival. They require oxygen for respiration and survival. Number two is anaerobic bacteria. Anaerobic bacteria do not require oxygen for respiration as well as for survival. Then number three is what we call the facultative bacteria. Now, facultative bacteria are bacteria that can survive both in aerobic and anaerobic conditions. They survive in aerobic and anaerobic conditions. Now, moving to the next type of bacteria, we said, we, uh, but there is a type of bacteria based on shape. Based on shape. Now, based on shape, we have about four types of bacteria. Four types. Number one, we have what we call the cocci bacteria. It means that this bacteria is spherical, okay? Spherical or secular bacteria. Then we have the bacillus or bacilli bacteria. The bacilli bacteria means a rod-like bacteria. We have the vibrio bacteria. The vibrio bacteria has a shape of a curve, okay, like a comma. Then we have the spirulae. The spirulae, the bacteria, the shape of the bacteria is twisted or spiral. All right. Now let's start with the first one, which is called the cocci bacteria. Now, cocci bacteria, like I said before, they are secular in shape or spherical in shape. Now, we have different types of cocci bacteria, but it has to do with the arrangement of each shape, of each bacteria. Now, there are some um, cocci bacteria that occur in straight chains. They occur in straight chains. We're going to be seeing the structure later. They occur in straight chains. These bacteria are called, or these bacteria, they are called streptococci bacteria. An example of a streptococci bacteria is the sore throat bacteria, the bacteria that causes sore throat. Another type of bac cocci bacteria is a bacteria that occur in clusters or in colonies. They are clumped together. Now, those bacteria, they are called staphylococci bacteria. Staphylococcal bacteria. Now, that is the bacteria that causes boils. They cause boil. Staphylococci bacteria. Then we also have some cocci bacteria that occur in pairs. 
that's in twos. They call them diplococci bacteria. Example of a diplococci bacteria is the bacteria that causes pneumonia. Then we also have um, um, bacteria that occurs in fours. Now, those ones are called the tetrads. You can see them on the screen. You see that the cocos bacteria is spherical, mostly in terms of the coca. You see the streptococci, they are in chains, straight chains. Okay, you see the, see the spirit, spirulae, we're going to come to that. That is that of the bacillus. You can see the diplococci, they occur in pairs. They occur in pairs. Now, let's move to the bacillus or the bacilli bacteria. Bacilli or bacillus simply means rod-like. It means rod-like. So these are bacteria that are rod-like. Now, most bacilli bacteria have flagella for locomotion. Remember when we were looking at some basic facts about bacteria, we said that some of them possess flagella for movement or locomotion. An example of a bacilli bacteria or bacillus bacteria is the bacteria that causes typhoid fever, and that is Salmonella typhi. Salmonella typhi is an example of a bacilli bacteria. Number two or number three, the third type of um, bacteria based on shape is what we call the Vibrio cholera or Vibrio bacteria. Vibrio bacteria. And Vibrio simply means it is curved. Vibrio, curved. And we have an example is the bacteria that causes cholera. And that bacteria is caused, called Vibrio cholerae. Vibrio cholerae. Number four is the spirulae bacteria. The spirulae bacteria. The shape is, is that, if you can see on the screen, the shape is twisted or spiral. An example is the bacteria that causes syphilis. And the bacteria that causes syphilis is called Treponema pallidum. Treponema pallidum causes syphilis. We're going to still see more as we continue in this class. Now, the third type of microorganism is the protozoa. Remember, we've talked about the virus as an example or as a type of microorganism. We've talked about bacteria as a type of microorganism. Now we are looking at the protozoa as a type of microorganism. Now, the protozoa are usually free living and unicellular organisms. Free living and unicellular organisms. The structure we have there on the screen is a paramecium. So other examples of protozoa, we have amoeba, we have trypanosome, we have plasmodium, and so many others, all right? Number four is the fourth type of bacteria, or oh, sorry, of uh, microorganism is the fungi. Now, fungi, they are eukaryotes. It simply means that they have definite what? Um, nucleus. They have definite nucleus. Now, most fungi are parasitic and some are saprophytic. And please always remember, a fungi is a non-green plant. Fungi, they are non-green plant. Now, some examples of fungi that are microscopic includes the mold, the bread mold, and so on. We also have yeast. Yeast. So these are, are actually uh, microscopic fungi. And then the last type of microorganism we're going to be looking at is the algae. The algae, the algae. The algae are, we have several types of algae. We have the green algae, which is the chlorophyta. We have the red algae. We have the brown algae, which is the phacophyta. And they are mostly found in, in, in mainly in water. Examples of algae, we have the diatoms. We have um, the spirogyra. We have the volvox. We have the nostoc, and so many others. These are different types of algae. Okay, now moving to the next thing in this particular topic on microorganisms around us, we will be talking about the concept of culturing. If you to take your mind back to um, when we started this particular topic, I said there are several important basic, or will I call it basic um, um, facts about microorganisms. And one of the facts I said is that microorganisms can be grown in the laboratory. We can grow microorganisms in the laboratory. Now, the process of growing microorganisms or technique of growing microorganisms in the laboratory is what we call culturing. Culturing. And culturing is carried out in special media, which we call a culture media. 
they are carried out in special media called culture media. Now, microorganisms that can be cultured include bacteria, we can culture fungi, we can culture protozoa, we can also culture algae. The one we cannot culture in the laboratory is virus. Virus cannot be cultured in the laboratory because virus cannot or can only grow and multiply inside a living cell. A culture media is not a living cell. Okay? They are just extracts of nutrients put together. All right? But virus can only grow, can only grow in living organisms or in living cells. It cannot grow in a culture media. So we can't grow um, virus in the laboratory. The microorganisms we can grow include um, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, as well as what? Algae. Now, what makes up a culture media? Now, like I said before, I said a culture media is made up of what we call a jelly-like material called algae, or sorry, agar. It's called agar, a jelly-like material called agar. It is obtained from seaweeds. Now, another thing again that makes up a culture media is what the different types of extracts. They are uh, nutrients called extracts. We have beef extracts, we have yeast extracts, we have vegetable extract. In combination with an agar, gives rise to what we call a culture media. Gives rise to a culture media. Now, how do we prepare culture medias? Now, there are four important steps in preparing a culture media. Now, the first step to prepare a culture media is to prepare the culture media first in a sterile condition. That means that uh, they call the, the, you prepare the agar under a sterile uh, condition. The agar is usually in powdered form, and you have to get a distilled water. You have to get distilled water and appropriately mix the two to get a solution. Are you getting me? To get a solution. And you must do this under a sterile condition. It simply means that um, your um, conical flask you're making use of must be sterile. Whatever apparatus or instrument or material or tools you're using must all be sterile. Then after you have gotten your culture solution, you boil the culture solution in an incubator you boil the culture solution. Now, after boiling the culture solution, you pour the culture solution into sterile Petri dishes. Now, Petri dish, they add plates. We call that um, um, culture plates. You pour them into uh, sterile Petri dishes and allow the culture solution inside of the per uh, sterile Petri dish to cool and set in. Now, when it cools and sets in, it looks like a jelly. Okay, it wobbles. It looks like a jelly. Now, after you have done that, you have actually prepared your culture media. You cover and then keep in a safe and sterile environment. Now, how do we identify microorganisms in the laboratory? What are the things we do to study microorganisms? Now, how do we identify them? One, one of the ways we identify microorganisms is the use of what? A microscope the use of a microscope. The second one is the use of a culture media. Use of a culture media. Now, if I want to check microscope in water, in a water sample, one of the ways I can use to check the, uh, if there is presence of microorganisms in a water sample is to take a drop of water and put it in a, um, in a, um, a glass slide, a microscope slide, and then cover it with a lead slide and view under a microscope using different um, magnifications. If I, I will definitely see something, if that water is actually infested with microorganisms, definitely you will see. So it's one way to identify microorganisms in, um, in our environment, all right? Now, another way to identify microorganisms is using a cultural media using a culture media. Now let's see how we can identify microorganisms using culture media. There are important steps to take 
when um, kind of carrying out this experiment. Now, four important steps. Number one is that you prepare the culture media. I have showed you how to prepare a culture media, that you prepare the agar in a sterile condition. And after you prepare the agar in sterile condition, you boil it. You boil the culture solution. After boiling the culture solution, you pour it into a sterile petri dish. After pouring it in a sterile petri dish, you allow it to cool and then set in. Now, after you are done with that, that is the preparation of the cultured media, the second stage is inoculation, to inoculate. Now, inoculation has to do with making, making use of your wire loop. You have what, what we call a wire loop. And then if I want to check if there is microorganism on my skin, for instance, I will take the wire loop and make a scrap or on my fingernails, make a scrap on my fingernails, and then I will inoculate it by making a streak. I'm going to show you making a streak on the culture media. <clears throat> now, after you have done making the streak on the culture media, you cover your petri, uh, your, your petri dish or your culture plate and then incubate it. That is the third stage called incubation. You put it in an incubator for 48 hours. Now, after 48 hours, you carry out examination or you observe. Now, the examination, if, if you see growth, you see certain things like dust-like particles surrounding um, a particular area in the culture media, that means that there is growth of microorganism. But if it remains clear and plain again as it was before, it means that there is no growth. Now, take a look at this. Now, you can see something that looks like um, a metal, okay? Now, the person is making a streak on it. That is a culture media. That things, those lines you see on the culture media, the culture media is red, as you can see on the screen, but those lines are the streaks that are made. That lines that are made are called inoculation. After inoculation, you cover the petri dish and put it in the incubator, you put it in the incubator and allow it for 48 hours. After 48 hours, you carry out examination of that um, cultured uh, petri dish. All right? So that is how we carry out uh, culturing techniques in identifying microorganisms in our environment. Next to discuss is ways through which microorganisms enter into the body ways microorganisms enter into the body. Now, there are several ways microorganisms enter into the body. You won't see a microorganism holding spears and daggers and knives and coming to you to invade you. No, there are ways or methods through which they get into our body. One of them is through sexual contact, through sexual contact. Another one is by direct contact with body fluids. When you make direct contact with body fluids like blood, that's why it's very important to take care when someone is doing a blood transfusion. The blood needs to be screened thoroughly to ensure there are no presence of microorganisms or other defects because microorganisms can also be transferred through direct contact with body fluids. Another way is through the nose and mouth. Another way is through which microorganisms can be transmitted from one body to another is through cuts in the skin and also through bites, through bites. Next is carriers of microorganisms. Now, microorganisms don't move on their own to invade or enter into the body. Most of them have mediums or agents that helps to transmit them from one body or one place to another. So we call these agents carriers of microorganisms. Now we have two types of carriers of microorganisms. We have the living carriers and then we have the non-living carriers. Living carriers are referred to as vectors. Another name for living carriers are vectors. And then we have the non-living carriers. Now let's take a look at some of the vectors the microorganisms they carry, and the disease they transmit. An example is the female Anopheles mosquito. The female Anopheles mosquito. It carries the microorganism called plasmodium. And plasmodium causes the disease called malaria. 
please, it's not the female Anopheles mosquito that causes malaria. It rather transmits a microorganism which is plasmodium that causes malaria. Also, we have another vector which is called the Aedes mosquito. The Aedes mosquito carries a virus and this virus transmits disease, the disease called yellow fever. We also have the house fly. The house fly transmits several bacteria in terms of um, cholera. It, it, some of them causes the disease called cholera. We have the typhoid fever. Um, the microorganism that the uh, fly uh, uh, transmit that causes cholera is called vibrocholerae, is a bacteria, while the one that causes typhoid fever is called salmonella typhi. Then we also have another um, living carrier of vector called sesefly. It transmits the disease, or sorry, transmits the uh, microorganism called trypanosome. And trypanosome causes the disease called nagana which is also known as sleeping sickness or trypanosomiasis. Lastly, we're going to be looking at non-living carriers. Non-living carriers. This means agents that help also to transmit uh, microorganisms from one place to another. Now, examples of non-living carriers include air. We also have water. We have food and so many other agents. That's why we have things like the airborne diseases. We also have waterborne diseases. We also have foodborne diseases. Now, this is where we call it a wrap up on this particular class. But before we go, let's take a look at one or two questions from our exam guide app. Um, okay. Just two questions. Um, we have just two here. Now, look at question one. Only specially adapted microorganisms are found in. Now, if you look at, I told you microorganisms can be found everywhere. Now, this will also help us in our next class, which we're going to have, um, or sorry, the third class, which we're going to have in terms of controlling microorganisms. But let me give you the answers to this. The correct answer is salty water. Now, the reason why we said salty water is because most microorganisms are controlled by salt. Salt is one way the uh, microorganisms, the spread of microorganisms can be controlled. So if you will actually find microorganisms there, it, it means that these microorganisms have special adaptive features to stay in salty environment in salty environment. So only specially adapted microorganisms can be found in salty waters. And then lastly, the bacteria that type that are arranged in chains are the, remember I told you we have um, different types of bacteria. Option A said bacilli. Bacilli, they are not arranged in chains, they are rod-like. And then we have the streptococci. Streptococci, they are arranged in chains. Okay, so that is the correct answer. But look at option C. They said it's staphylococci. And I said staphylococci, they are arranged in clusters or in colonies. And then we also have the clostridia, which is also an example, I think, of a... Um, um, an example of a bacilli bacteria. So the correct answer to this question is B, option B, which is streptococci, the bacteria that is arranged in chains. Thank you for participating in today's class. You can practice more questions using your exam guide app. The app scores and gives a detailed explanation of all the questions at the end of your practice test. You can also learn particular topics of interest with different modes like study mode, uh, mock mode, and even practice mode. It, is also, it also has other features that makes learning very fun. Now, it is a must for all serious students. Download from www.examguide.com if you don't have it yet. See you in the next class. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels hit the notific notification bell and share the videos to your loved ones and friends that will benefit from it. Bye for now.